And here's the other thing that we need to do then. Working back from 2021, we need to have a strategy to win. And that means we need to put together a prospectus for self-government in this country which answers some of the questions that were left unanswered in 2014, which takes account of changed circumstances, particularly Brexit and the change in the constitutional position of the United Kingdom, and it seeks to build a majority political alliance behind it on the basis that self-government will make things better for people. I think we can do that, and I think there are four themes that we should accentuate. The first of them is we should talk about a prosperous Scotland. We will not get a majority of our fellow citizens to vote for independence if they believe it will lead to their impoverishment. And there is no, idea, no reason why it should and we should say so. The figures that were uh, produced yesterday and, and wide, were widely reported that the uh, Scottish deficit is falling. I suppose some people might be pleased to know that. The truth is there's no such thing as a Scottish deficit because there's no such thing as a separate national Scottish economy. So we can actually measure a Scottish deficit. What we have is a measure of the performance of a regional economy within a much bigger state called the United Kingdom. And to get to those figures, a whole lot of assumptions are made and estimates are made which simply would not apply if you were trying to do a balance sheet for an independent country. But most of all, (laughs) no allowance is made for the fact that an independent Scottish government might of itself choose to do things differently, which would then lead to a situation where, we, of course, we can afford the level of public provision that we want. And I would actually say that the JERS figures, I'm sure most in this audience know the acronym, the JERS figures are not uh, a reason to not consider alternative ways of running the Scottish comedy, uh, co- uh, co- economy. They're actually an indictment of the current situation of Scotland being a regional economy within the United Kingdom. So if anything, it's because of that apparent deficit at the minute that we should be seeking to take control of the main economic levers that any independent government would expect to have so that we can begin to build our economy so that we can increase productivity and invest dramatically in our renewable energy resources and in our infrastructure. And if we do that, I believe we could be not just a successful economy, but we could see levels of growth which far outperform the rest of the United Kingdom because as a peripheral economy, we have effectively been held back for quite some time. The second theme would be to have a democratic Scotland. I realize I may be, am I going, I'm probably going on far too long here. But um, I think we need to have a democratic Scotland. And it strikes me as really quite amazing that it's almost a generation since the last local government reform in Scotland. And we have a system of 32 local councils in Scotland, which was essentially the boundaries were decided by Michael Forsyth, now Lord Forsyth. And the funding system in which they're based, with a few changes along the way, is essentially the same as devised by Michael Heseltine, now Lord Heseltine. Now, I think as a country we should aspire to do rather better than a system that we have been bequeathed from two Tory grandees. And I believe that we can do a lot better. Leslie Riddick, last year at the same time, outlined quite a few plans for the reform of local government, and I would associate with myself with all the sentiments that Leslie said. I don't want to repeat them, but I want to stress one thing, and that is that we need to get away from the mindset that says that if you're trying to rearrange how things are governed, then you also have to rearrange the management of every service. You know, Edinburgh could have 12 local councils operating within the city. It doesn't mean we have to have 12 refuse departments. Far from it. It just means that people in local areas can decide what their priorities are. And if they want, they can add a precept onto the local tax, which allows them to have a better level of service or to do something that doesn't happen elsewhere. And I believe that's the way we need to be thinking and engaging people in that debate. Now, that's probably going to take That's probably after we become an independent country, in truth. But um, the other thing that we should be doing in terms of a democratic country, and I'm not sure if there are people in this room who are already engaged in this, but I think there is a lot of work to do in beginning to develop a new constitution for an independent Scotland, which will set out 
the rules and obligations and expectations, not just of citizens, but of different layers of government and show how they connect together. And I don't, I think that is a debate that would continue after we decide to become an independent country and we should be ratifying a constitution at some stage after a vote on the principle of becoming independent. But I think much of the thinking ought to start now. Thirdly, I think we need to be a caring Scotland. I think one of the best things about the Scottish government is that it has defended the principle of universalism in public service provision. The old adage that, you know, to everybody according to their needs and from everybody according to their abilities. It has defended that against many critics who go on about rich pensioners shouldn't be getting bus passes and all the rest of it. And it's done that because it's the right way to organize the services in a community. And because if you don't do that and you begin to say, oh, only the really needy people should be getting this, then you residualize the service and you lose public support for the service and you lose public support for people paying taxes to fund the service. So I believe we need to argue about this and as we go forward building on the new Scottish social security system, we need also to make plans for how we would take over the remaining functions of social security, most of which are being retained by Westminster, and how in an independent country we would devise a taxation system that was fair, that was equitable, and that you weren't able to cheat. So those are challenges for building a caring Scotland in our new prospectus. And finally, we need to talk about an open Scotland. And that means this country needs to be seen as a beacon that welcomes people from across the world. We have an immigration problem in Scotland. We don't have enough of it. And we need policies that will encourage people to come and relocate here. We need a drive to try and educate and involve the people who are already here in welcoming and integrating those who come. And we need to realize that the Scotland of the future ought to be a multinational, multi-ethnic, diverse country that is welcoming to the rest of the world. And we can do that as a beacon, I think, against others who put forward a contrary view. And that should be part of our new perspectives for Scotland as well. And I think if we begin to build in those themes and work out a new perspectives and spend the next year developing it, and then three years arguing for it, I believe we will be able to take the next step. Because I believe what happened in September the 18th, 2014, was not the high watermark of the campaign for self-government. That was but the new base camp from which we go forward in the future. Now, we have some distance yet to travel. And I, want to find, I want to end by this, by going back to Thomas Muir and considering how we should do it. I speak not for the SNP, but I speak as an SNP politician. But I know that the SNP can only take this campaign so far. It will take more than the SNP for this country to become an independent country. And I think most of us in the party recognize that. So what is important is that we begin to create a movement and a momentum that involves ordinary people who don't want to be associated with a political party, but who may indeed be members of other political parties or none, who come together for a common objective. And I go back and finishing to Thomas Muir, who when he and William Skirving set up the Friends of the People in this city in 1792, they took the name of a similar organization that had already been established in London. But there was one crucial difference. In London, you had to pay three guineas subscription to join and it was effectively a closed secret society. Muir insisted that the friends of the people in Edinburgh should be open to all and that everyone should be able to come to their meetings, knowing full well that there would be government spies amongst the audience. But he felt it was important that we should always advocate these things in public. We should always reach out beyond the people who already believe to those who are thinking about it and welcome them in to the cause in the future. That's the task that lies ahead of us. I believe that we are up to it, and I believe that in a few short years, we will be facing the prospect of this country becoming the newest self-governing nation in the world.
So there you go, that was the Thomas Muir Lecture 2017. The only other things to let you know that I sent out five emails this morning looking for guests, and a couple have responded already, so should be able to get something out not too long, and I promise it won't be as long as it was this time. But, you know, stuff's been happening. And well, that'll wrap it up for this time. So, after hearing the Thomas Muir Lecture, I think the only reasonable song to play out with is Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill by Dick Gochen. Speak to you next time. The people throughout our history. Who have been part of the struggle for a self-determining independent Scotland. And he mentioned one by name. Who I was never taught about when I went to school. There's a man called Thomas Muir. And this song is about him. Written by Adam McNaughton. My name is Thomas Muir. As a lawyer I was trained. Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill. But you branded me an outlaw for sedition I'm arraigned. Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill But I never preach sedition in any shape or form And against the Constitution I have never raised the storm It's the scoundrels who corrupted it that I want to reform Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill My Lord, you judge me guilty before the trial began Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill And the jury that you picked a Tory placeman to a man Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill Yet here I stand for judgment on a fate what may befall Though your spies were in my parish kirk and in my father's hall Not one of them can testify I ever broke a law Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill Yes, I spoke to Paisley Weavers and addressed the city's youth Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill For neither age nor class should be a barrier to the truth Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill My lord, you may chastise them with your vitriolic tongue You say that books are dangerous to those I moved among But the future of our land is with the workers and the young Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill Members of the jury, it's not me who's being tried Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill Two hundred years in future, they will mind what you decide Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill You may send me to Van Diemen's land Or clap me in the jail Grant me death or grant me liberty My spirit will not fail For my cause it is a just one And my cause it will prevail Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill With quiet words and dignity Muir led his own defence Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill He appeared completely blameless to those with common sense Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill When he had finished speaking, the courtroom rang with cheers Lord Braxfield said this outburst confirms our deepest fears And he sentenced Thomas Muir to be transported 14 years Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill Gerard Palmer Skirvin, Thomas Muir and Margaret Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill These are names that every Scottish man and woman ought to know Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill When you're called for jury service When your name is drawn by lot When you vote in an election When you freely voice your thought Don't take these things for granted For dearly were they bought Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill